ready to allow me, David. I'm doing that right now. Oh, oh, wait, I don't want to do that. Okay. So I want a copy of that uh, picture that Ken has, because that would come in handy in future presentations. Presentations, yep. <laughs> Even, even I could use it for this presentation too. I've already got one though, similar to that. Okay, I believe you can share now, Bill. Okay, let's see. That should bring it up. Yes, sir. Grounding and bonding safety in RFI, radio frequency interference. So like David said, I, uh, I think you'll find this useful. Even if you have a handy talkie, you're probably not gonna ground and bond it. But uh, if there's lightning within 10 miles, go inside, you can use the handy talkie inside. <laughs> okay, so I have a story that relates to this. I was, a, I was never a young airman, but I was a new airman in my first duty station in the Panama Canal Zone at an HF receiver site. And someone had given me an old AC-DC radio. That means you could plug it into 120 volts DC or AC and it would work. So I put it on the workbench, I plugged it in. And then as I was taught, I had my left hand in my pocket and I grabbed the big grounding or bonding strap with a giant clip on it and approached the radio. And as soon as I touched the chassis, a big spark flew and the circuit breaker blew. That's one of the reasons we bond everything together. I should have bonded it, grounded it first and then went to plug it in the spark would have occurred at the AC outlet, but fortunately I had my hand in my pocket. So what am I gonna to talk to you today? This is about safety. Safety always comes first. My last job uh, uh, long after Air Force retired was working on oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico because of the Macondo disaster. And part of my job was helping to change the safety culture so that people thought and acted safely. There's a lot of unsafety in, in amateur radio. If you're around an antenna installation on a tower, you should be nowhere close to that tower without a hard hat, without a hard hat. You've got to wear hard hats and gloves and climbing boots. Uh, a friend of mine who used to live here and I were communicating this week about tower safety. <coughs> pardon me, and I have two friends who died in tower accidents. So safety is a big deal. This is true for electricity. Electricity can be very dangerous. So we have to do it safely. And then bonding everything together, all the gear in our shacks helps to keep the noise down. It can reduce noise and we get enough noise as it is. Just turn on the TV and you'll see that. And then radio frequency interference is related to bonding our equipment. And I'm going to talk some a bit about that. And of course, next Saturday, Ward Silver, November Zero Alpha X-ray, good friend of mine, lives in Missouri, will be talking about the same subject. Buy his book. It's available from the ARRL, Grounding Bonding. Now, what's the safety thing? The National Electrical Code is all about safety. And of course, in, with electricity, it's the current that kills us. You can have a high voltage applied to your body and not get electrocuted if the current is low. You can have a low voltage applied to your body. And if your body conducts enough, if there's enough moisture in your fingers when you touch it, for example, 20 milliamps or more is likely to kill you, a very small current. So we combine these two, grounding and bonding, and they're two different things, two different concepts for safety. And then, of course, lightning protection. 
nothing's going to prevent lightning. The only way you can prevent light, lightning is to go somewhere else where there isn't any at the time. <laughs> Somebody's mic's not muted. <laughs> so don't think any, all the thousands of dollars you spend or hundreds or tens. I worked in commercial broadcasting and wherever I worked, the grounding and bonding was much better than any of what you have in your shacks. And I made a lot of money replacing stuff that blew up. So we can protect from lightning, especially nearby strikes, but we can't prevent it. This is not Ken's shack. I don't know where I got this picture, but this gives you an idea of why we have a national electrical code that licensed electricians don't follow that example. That it's just terrible. Shouldn't be like that. Your shack shouldn't be like that. And neither neither should your house be like that. Well, that's strange. I'm hearing myself come back from somebody's place. Okay, I'm turning on my laser pointer now. So this is bad stuff. B A D Bravo Alpha Delta bad. You want to avoid it. So the National Electrical Code actually comes from the National Fire Protection Association. They're the ones who write this, and this code has been written in blood and lives lost and lessons learned from those lives that were lost. So it's a big deal. And the whole point of it is don't get your butt shocked. That's my own acronym, D-G-Y-B-S. Don't get your butt shocked. Well, one of the first things you ought to do and if you haven't done it recently, is buy one of those $5 outlet testers. You can get them at Home Depot, uh, made in China, but you won't get the virus from it. Plug it in and check to see that things are wired correctly. I did that when we first moved into this home, which was originally owned by my mom and dad, their retirement home, and now here I am retired. And I found some errors. I also found that the labeling at the panel wasn't correct when I tried to disconnect a switch and there was a spark. Things like loose connections. If you transmit and the lights dim, that means there's voltage drop that shouldn't exist. If the house wiring is old, let's say more than 10 years old, check the connections, turn circuit breakers off, ensure that the connections under the outlets are good and tight, try it again. If not, there's a good chance the wiring is too small for the current draw. Need to fix those. Loose connections cause fires because loose connections increase resistance, which increases heat. And eventually with enough heat and a source of fuel, you've got oxygen, it turns to fire. And then my goodness sakes, this happens all the time. That stupid green wire, I can't plug it in. I've got a two conductor extension cord. That's what I wanna use. And of course, this is the famous Darwin Award thing. Here, hold my beer. What could go wrong while I cut this wire? Well, I'll tell you what can go wrong. People can get electrocuted. So that National Electric Code following it is a requirement for insurers it's in your contract, read it. If you do things that don't follow the code and your house burns down, it may not be covered by insurance. Now I've got your attention. So what does the NEC say about grounding? Primary importance, ground the neutral wire at the breaker panel only, nowhere else. So don't attach a ground rod to the neutral wire in your shack. That should be done at the entrance panel. And it's wise to check it out to be sure that it's attached properly. It's not loose or corroded. A big thing with something that the NEC tells us in Ward's book two, based on the NEC, is ground to a single point. And all that does, it means that all of our gear is at the same level or potential 
and remember what voltage is, potential. If there's a potential difference in voltage, current can flow and flowing current where it doesn't belong can damage equipment. And then inspect at least annually. This is something we did regularly when I was in the Air Force in electronics. We looked at all of our grounds annually to be sure that they were safe. And we had equipment we could actually measure how effective the ground, each of the grounds was in communications uh, facilities. And if you don't know, get help. Get Ward's book, read and understand Ward's book, and apply as much of what his advice in, is in there as you possibly can. Oh, by the way, sometimes municipalities make changes to make things more restrictive or add to the National Electrical Code. Once again, those have to be followed by law. So that local code matters. And I've talked about the insurance payment. Now, remember 120 volts kills people all the time. Every year people die because they do dumb things trying to win the Darwin Award. Don't you be one of those. Now let's talk about bonding, which again is not grounding. And we, we interchange these terms incorrectly. Grounding in, in Britain, even though they talk funny and use different words, they use some, a word called earthing. That's what we're talking about here, grounding. Bonding is when we tie things together. It needs to be robust, which means heavy conductors, thick conductors. The thicker the wire is, the bigger, or the smaller the gauge, the lower the resistance, and as short as possible. If you have a piece of gear in your shack and it's not a radio, it still needs to be bonded. All together, short, low resistance, heavy wires. And in today's world, I don't, do I have it running now? Yeah, there goes FT8 now. I see it's transmitting. That computer is an important element of my station system. And if it's not bounded, it can create problems with, if I get a nearby lightning strike or even radio frequency interference. And I'll talk more about that later. The thing to understand about lightning is it's not, doesn't come from a battery and it's a pulse. It rises very rapidly and it falls very rapidly. It is not direct current. So inductance matters. Lightning has a very fast rise time and a very fast decay time. And the, the, what that means is even a straight wire has inductance. Normally we think of inductors as coiled up wires, but a straight wire, if the frequency is high enough or if the pulse has a very fast rise time, that's inductance. And so that's why we need to keep the wire short. And now some of the upcoming slides are thanks to Jim Brown, K9YC, lives out in uh, Northern California, who's done great presentations on this subject and collaborated with uh, Ward Silver on the book. So again, what do you bond? Here's a list of the things that bond. This is the most important and primary one, where, which should be done first, usually is, but nothing is guaranteed in life, including this. If you have a landline, it should be grounded, which means you bond it to the power service entry point. Same with cable TV, antennas, and not just our ham antennas, but if you've got an external TV antenna, that needs to be bonded to the central point ground as well. If you're a cheap ham, pardon the redundancy, but let's say you're a ham who got one of those uh, 
uh, used military metal desks. There's metal all over it. That should be bonded because if something shorts and that po potential exists between that desk, the metal on the desk and a ground somewhere, and you become a way for current to flow, you may live to regret that, hopefully live. And of course, all ground rods get bonded together. If you've got a tower near the building, that needs to be grounded to the uh, power service entry. Uh, and if you building with steel structures, they get grounded too. I got out of bed this morning, put my hand on the side of the mattress and discovered that the uh, the ribbing around the mattress has a metal foundation. I got zapped. It's that time of year, the humidity is relatively low. Finally, maybe it will stay that way for a while, but of course we need the moisture. And of course, grounded metallic plumbing, a lot of plumbing today is not metallic. And so I love it how people ground to a faucet that's connected to PVC pipe, doesn't work well. So how do you do this bonding? Again, everything together. These are the things I talked about. Oh, I forgot to mention cable TV, if you have that, when that comes in. And the central point is there at the breaker panel. The breaker panel has a ground rod attached to it. And if it's metallic piping, that's connected there as well. Make sure that it is. And so you see it all gets, and this is all about safety, being safe. If we have everything bonded together, there can't be a potential difference from one device to another. And if like that story I told you, where the AC cord, it's always the hot side of the cord, never the neutral side, connects to the chassis, it will blow a circuit breaker keeping you and me safe. Very important. Okay, so bigger the better. Number four, American wire gauge, AWG for towers. Number 10 in the shack, heavy duty stuff. Uh, you can use things like uh, shielding from coax as long as it's not corroded. Don't use it if it's that old. The shorter the better, I talked about in inductance. So Resistance is futile. <laughs> I'm a Star Trek fan, right? So you wanna keep resistance and inductance low or the impedance to that pulse of lightning. And by the way, you don't need a lightning, a direct lightning strike to cause damage. That most damage occurs from lightning strikes that are nearby. Okay, so. Lightning doesn't follow maps or how you designed it on a piece of paper. It just goes wherever it wants to. We don't know, that's why we bond everything together. One of the big problems today uh, is the hum and buzz created by unbalanced antennas that have common mode current and don't have RF chokes in them. Another way that hum and buzz occurs on our transmit signals is when all the equipment is not bonded together and there becomes a potential difference between pieces of equipment. And since we use computers a lot, in many cases, they generate audio we transmit in things like WSJT-X for FT8 and FT4, bonding is really important. The shields, that are on things like mic cords or audio cables between pieces of equipment carry leakage currents. And those leakages come from various sources such as bypass capacitors used to keep RFI out of or leaving pieces of gear and then Shields carry that equipment. I'm gonna show you a little bit more about what's something called the pin one problem. And they can act as antennas, poor shielding on cables. And boy, a lot of USB cables and things like that are just terrible. 
will pick up and radiate signals. So doing those right is important. Now, what's this pin one problem? I'll show you a schematic here. What happens is most of the radios today, and I can't don't have one here I can pick up and show you, but oftentimes you'll have a radio where the mic cord has a shield on it and where it connects to that connector, that's not a metal chassis. And so the shield goes further without being connected to anything until it gets to a circuit board inside the radio. That's called the pin one problem where it, the shield is not, and that comes from a mic, professional mic uh, uh, designations. Now that shield isn't connected to the chassis so the chassis can't effectively keep the hum out of the gear. And so it allows for RFI. Now what, what is, this may help some of those of you who are visual learners. So this is the mic cable coming in here and it's got a shield, but the shield is not attached to a shield in enclosure. It's a plastic case and it gets connected to the signal circuitry board and that can cause hum and noise often mistaken for different reasons. So interestingly, Jim uh, often goes to the Hampton, usually as a guest speaker. And in 2014, he went around to all these booths and most of the others. And what he found was a bunch of radios that had the pin one problem where that Mike Shield was not connected to the metal chassis, if there was one. So guidelines for bonding. If you have an unbalanced audio path, like a cable coming out of your computer going to your radio with relatively low, even line level, about a volt or so of audio, often very less because you have to go to a microphone input on a radio that doesn't have a line input. It's very susceptible to this hum and noise. And so what you want to do is have everything bonded together. I'm going to show you a picture here in a moment of what that looks like. I already told you the number 10 copper or braid from coaxial cable, even the house wiring, stranded house wiring, Number 10, THHN, you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's will work, but that's stiffer and harder to work with. Uh, what I do is my bonding straps, the short ones that come off the gear with a green power point, not red or black, but green for ground, so that I can pull the radio away and not have to disconnect the far end of it. And then I can push it back in and plug it back in always, and again, as short as possible. I push it back into where I can reach in and connect those two Anderson power poles together. So here we are today. This is the most critical aspect of bonding today when it comes to hum and noise is between the computer and the radio. But you also want to include the amplifier if you have it, and even the amplifier power supply. And that's a whole nother presentation. Uh, for example, uh, what's the big, the big power supplies, heavy duty ones begins with an A, I can't remember, but those, Astron. say again? Astron. Astron, thank you. Astron often has the negative lead attached to the chassis of the power supply. That's a no-no, that's wrong. Those should be separated. That the safety bonding through the green wire in the AC cord and the bonding you do between the power supply and the rig or the amplifier should be separate leads. So what's this radio frequency interference stuff? 
Oh my goodness, switching mode power supplies. Do I have one? Yeah, here's one. I don't know what this is connected to. I have a lot of stuff here, but whatever it's connected to, it's not operating right now. Here's an example of a switching mode power supply. It puts out 15 volts at 800 milliamps. Who knows, something over there. Uh, it's very compact and it's very light because there's a little oscillator in here that operates at 100 or 200 kilohertz and takes the rectified AC power, converts it to DC, and then it goes into AC again, where it can be regulated easily and cheaply without a heavy transformer, and it doesn't draw much current. It's light and it doesn't have iron in it, so it's cheap. Charlie Echo, Alpha Papa, cheap. You're a ham, you understand what cheap means. The problem is many of them are poorly designed and they generate, those oscillators generate lots of harmonics that we may be able to hear. And as I say, if it ain't heavy, it ain't R, it's RFI, it's causing interference. Sometimes we have to take devices like that if it's a weird uh, voltage level and put it inside a box to keep the RFI inside. And then all that new stuff your neighbors buy. I was one of those. I bought my wife a plasma TV way back to watch the Super Bowl. If I could have keyed that and selected a particular frequency, I could have operated QRP with it as a transmitter. Boy, did it make noise. We gave it to our church and I bought an LED TV replacement. If you have noise, if you don't, I want to buy your house. But if you have noise, uh, you need to be sure that the noise isn't generated inside your own home. So the way you do that is you've got to identify what the source of the noise may be. So take your HF radio, hook it to an antenna, not during a thunderstorm, connect it to a battery, and go turn off the bra main breaker in your home and see what happens. If things get quieter, you've got a noise generator causing this radio frequency interference in your home. So now what you need to do is go back one breaker at a time and find the circuit on which this device is connected and replace it. In my shack, I have no 12 volt wall warts or nine volt wall warts. I use my switching supplies, which are very quiet to provide all the 12 volts I need. Right now, I have no noisy wall warts in my shack. Don't hear any noise from them. I've plugged, unplugged, plugged and unplugged, no noise. My HF radio is always connected to a 12 volt backup battery. If I pull the power, I can't really notice that I've lost power. I can be on the air. I'm on the air. If it's on, I'm on. So replace those culprits. Uh, a good thing to buy at ham fest is wall warts with voltages you need that are heavy. They've got iron in them, transformers, and they don't create that RFI. Now, how do you find it in your neighborhood if your home is quiet now? If you've got an HF beam, rotate the beam around, see where the noise seems to be loudest, and then see if you can null it out. That's the direction you need to go look. You grab a portable, oh, and this changes often with time, especially in today's solar powered world, where we have solar panels on top of people's homes that are notorious for generating RFI. Uh, usually there's not much you can do about that, except move, sadly. Uh, anything else would probably be illegal. Uh, I experience, this problem in the neighborhood 
with grow lamps. Now I'm not saying he's, this is what he was growing, but I have a pretty good idea <laughs> that it probably was. So these are the kinds of things you can do. And David's already made this presentation available to any of you who wants to download it. So you don't have to worry about taking notes or anything. Uh, lots of, if you're going to buy a solar system or um, uh, HVAC, uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, a washing machine, a range. Those of you who knew Randy K5RHD who moved to Boulder, uh, he's got the opposite problem where he transmits with 50 watts on 40 meters, his oven turns on. But if you're gonna buy these things, be sure you can return them at no cost to you if they cause radio frequency interference or if they do weird stuff when you transmit. This is a big problem today because those who design these systems could care less. Even the IEEE in their noise, a recent noise article complaining about noise didn't look below VHF. They could care less about HF, which is where we care. And LED lighting. You can buy the same make and model number of a bulb at a big box store on one day and a week later buy the same thing and it's still bad. Amazing. So I already mentioned, if you have RFI, move to the boondocks, get away from people. People aren't bad, but the stuff they buy <laughs> is bad. Why? We like we're addicted to cheap stuff. And cheap stuff is typically noisy, creating radio frequency interference. Do like I do, buy a new TV for your wife. That way she got to watch TV because when she was watching TV and I was in the shack, there wasn't much I could hear. I've got some examples of that uh, coming up here in a moment. Sometimes you can use a separate magnetic loop antenna to null out the noise. Oh, there it is. The noise is coming from that way. I don't hear it anymore. Or you should need a radio or an external device that would allow you to use a separate receive antenna from your transmit antenna. And then there are noise canceling systems that have pretty good capabilities. Uh, here's three of them that I listed that I have used. I'm um, just got an NCC one that I'll be hooking up with a noise antenna to use as a, to be able to null out the noise. And of course, many of our radios today have noise blinkers in, but quite frankly, more often than not, they're not effective for many reasons. And then by the way, if you use CW, the bandpass narrows down and guess what happens to the noise level? For example, in my case, it goes from about an S3 to an S4 on 40 meters on sideband down to an S1 on a 200 hertz bandpass on CW. And then of course, things like JT65 and FT8 that proponents tell you work below the noise, it's a lie, that's not true. The noise they measure and the decibel reading below that noise level comes from the fact that they start with a single sideband band pass. And then for FT8, the software goes down to about 40 or 50 Hertz. And that's why the noise goes down. They don't hear below the noise. That doesn't happen. Here's what it looked like here on 40 meters on my off center fed dipole with a LED, uh, uh, plasma TV. It was just horrible, absolutely horrible. That's what it looked on a dipole and it looked different on the vertical. But both of them suffered from that noise. It was bad news. Goodbye TV. And then I wanna remind you of Ward Silver's book, Grounding and Bonding for Us Radio Amateurs. It is very well written. It's relatively easy to understand. Well worth, I think it's it's under $20. I don't remember the exact price. I bought two. 
I think I loaned my first copy out and I don't know to whom. I hope you're enjoying it if you're listening. <laughs> and if you are, bring it back so I can loan it to someone else. Uh, buy the book. Well worth it. Follow the book. You may not be able to do everything, but the more you do, the safer you will be, the higher the probability of your equipment being damaged, not being damaged. It, that probability goes up. That's good. You don't want your equipment damaged. And I would like to point out again that I have made thousands of dollars in commercial broadcasting fixing gear that's much better protected than any of you have done. When lightning shows up, K-A-T-E disconnects any possible ingress. That includes antenna cables, a rotator cable. The DSL line is disconnected. That's a uh, copper line coming from the phone company. And the ethernet router is disconnected so that the, any long run won't uh, be able to connect to my gear because the long run might have an induced voltage in it that could damage equipment. If I lose the router, I lose the router, but I really don't want to lose my expensive radios. So what have I told you? Safety first, think safety. Grounding is the key to safety. A proper ground, a properly attached ground, and then bonded to everything. If it's an electrical device in your shack, bond it. It's good for safety and it helps to keep the noise down that you might generate in your own shack. And then I told you a little bit about RFI. I could do three different presentations just on RFI. And then buy the book. Okay, who's got some questions and where are you? There you are. I should stop sharing. I've got to maximize this to stop sharing. You can turn me off, can't you, David? I just did. Thank you. OK. I'm looking to see who fell asleep. Uh, it looks like Larry's asleep. But he normally, he normally looks like Bill, he's Bill. asleep. Mr. Bill. Yes, sir. OK, so, you know, you look at all this stuff here and I think a, a lot of uh, you know, we had talked about this, but by the way, it's great seeing you. I'm still alive. <laughs> um, a lot of people actually, when you look at all the stuff that's in that a double hour book and stuff, there's, a, you know, the first thing that comes a lot of people's mind is, you know, that's a lot of money. So what can a ham who doesn't have a lot of money do? for now to actually get your system grounded properly without having to go through a great expense. Okay, so you bought an IC7300 like everybody else, right? 30,000 of them, something like that sold. It's unbelievable. You spent a thousand bucks, maybe you spent more. Don't whine about spending a hundred dollars on your grounding and bonding system for heaven's sakes. Make sure that the green wire works in your shack. Plug an electrical tester. Ah, it must be in my toolbox. Plug an electrical tester in and check your outlets. First thing, that's the key. And then the next thing is make sure that the ground rod is attached to the wire that goes into the circuit breaker box at the entry point, first thing. Then you need to run at least a number 10 wire or strap from your shack where your radio gear is located right here. You can't see it, I can't move the monitor. Through an appropriate hole in the wall to in my case, I'm right next to the entry point. In your case, you might not be. 
that's okay. You can put an eight foot ground rod for 20 bucks maybe. It's steel plated in copper. Uh, I recommend getting a fence post driver, one of those things with two handles on it and you beat, beat the ground rod to death and your body. This is for young people. Find a young person to do this. I'm looking, you're out of luck here, but there are young people elsewhere. So, <laughs> so pound this ground rod into the ground and firmly attach that cable that just came out from your shack. Now, what I have, I spent 50 bucks for big fat ground strap, this two inches wide that goes across the back of my shack. I should have hooked my other camera up. I, I don't want to show you my, it's such a mess. Uh, there's a big hole in it where I had to pull a radio out that died. But so I've got nuts, bolts, uh, washers, and a lug. And so I've attached the number 10 wiring from each of the devices to that big strap. And actually my strap goes all the way out to the ground rod. So I've spent less than a hundred dollars and I can't tell you because Judy has spies everywhere how much, how many thousands of dollars of equipment are here. I did win one of it, the IC7610, I won, so I didn't pay for that. Uh, the new flex radio did cost me some money as, and the K4 is on the way any day now. That is a small, a small price to pay to protect your investment. So if you can't spend $100 on bonding and grounding, why do you have a $1,000 radio? If you have an HT, I can get to one of those easily. If you have an HT, this is not bonded, bond, bonded or grounded. I'm just holding it. But I don't get on the roof during a thunderstorm and hold it so I can describe the thunderstorm like people do on Facebook. Oh. Okay, it doesn't cost that much. Now, if you if your shack is on the other side of your home from the entry point where your commercial power comes in, put a ground rod near your shack. And then what you should do is run uh, number four wire between that ground rod and the main ground rod at the commercial power entry point. You want all, all ground rods to be at the same potential. And if you're going to do that, put a ground rod at each corner of your home and have a circle of number four or number two gauge between all of the grounds. You'll find that in Ward's book. That, you're gonna have to spend a couple hundred dollars to do that. Can you, What's can your you do recommendation? That I'm sorry? What is your recommendation on the length of a ground rod? Eight feet. National Electrical calls for at least eight feet. Then a tower, a tower is a whole nother thing. That's a whole nother presentation. But a tower, you should have three ground rods, all interconnected and preferably CAD welded. That's a whole nother thing. It's a cool thing though, because it's kind of like a mini explosion, right? When you, when you weld the ground, uh, the bonding cables to each of the ground rods. So that's kind of a cool thing to do. It, it, I see a lot of glazed over eyes. <laughs> that's why that's why I recommend you buy Ward's book because you can read two paragraphs while you drink your morning coffee, take a nap and your brain will rejuvenate and reinforce all that stuff in your head. And then you can get up in the afternoon and reread those two paragraphs and go, oh, I remember that. Hey, I've got a question for you about uh, ground rods. Go ahead, whoever that is. This is Blaine uh, Bachman. I, uh... Oh, years, ago, years ago, I had to uh, uh, put a new electrical service in a 60-year-old house that I was living in in Illinois. And uh, one of the things that 
Oh, hold, hold on, whoever's got a radio on, please mute. Mute. Thank you, Larry. Anyway, um, so on on placing the ground rod, one of the options at the time that was described in documentation that I purchased to help me out uh, said that if you had trouble driving the the ground rod in directly to the earth, you could dig a trench and lay it in there. And then cover it up. Is that uh, is that still allowed, or is that still even a good idea, or is that just a shortcut that'd be best avoided? That's a real common thing done for repeater systems, where they're on top of a mountain and there may not be uh, eight ground. feet of dirt yeah. in the ground. So yeah. yes, that's a very doable thing. the The intent is to get as much of that ground rod surface in contact with the earth okay of course the earth here in yeah that, that elmer's got a copy the earth here in new mexico unless you're in the river valley there's another one somebody somebody's got his mic still turned on please mute larry you're not muted uh the the, the intent is to get as much of that ground rod in contact with the earth as you possibly can. So that's why the NEC says eight feet. And again, as you mentioned, uh, one of the recommendations is you pound and pound it and it just won't go down anymore. You don't have any dynamite or C4. Uh, you can lay it horizontally in a trench. And there's no point in watering the ground. It's going to dry. What is the point of that? Why waste the water? Drink the water. It's good for old people. Yes, Elmer. Okay, thanks. You're welcome, Blaine. Before oh. you, and most important, we always talk about, what is the bill? We always do what before we put a ground rod in? Have a beer? Well, that too. How about call uh, 811? Oh, yeah. If you're going to dig, which... In effect, a ground rod is digging. You're making a hole in the ground. Call the uh, uh, locator folks. They'll be very glad you did. And if it's an electrical cable, you'll be very glad you did it and found out where the electrical cables are. So that's why I'm going to put my tower offset about 15 feet from the service entrance. And I've already heard or had the guys come out and mark where the electrical service goes. It goes off that way. It goes goes towards Jerry's house. Bill, this is Jim McKim. I uh, live on the west side and it's very sandy over here. And I found, I read in a book someplace, I made a, uh, got a PCV pipe and put it on, put a hose bib on it. Yeah. And I was able to, with that high pressure hose bib, go down eight feet in about two minutes and I put in two or three eight foot ground rods right outside the shack which uh, was very easy to do. The only problem I have is to connect those to my main entrance is so darn far and I'd have to go under three uh, three uh, a driveway and I don't know I haven't done that yet I don't see how I can do it reasonably. Bill, are you there are ways to do that, but I don't know that there are any cheap ways to do that. And what ha what's done a lot today is the people who install this stuff have high water pressure devices that they put down at the appropriate level to go under and then shoot a hole through the dirt. I'm not doing that. Bill? Yeah. Yes, who said Bill? David. Uh, just David. a quick accounting here. Uh, Jerry's trying to fill out the uh, net logger and he doesn't know who Richard's iPad is. Uh, the feller that is Richard's iPad, could you uh, come up and, and uh, unmute yourself and tell Jerry your last name and call sign? He's looking at his ID now. While he's doing that, are there any other questions about grounding, bonding, and radio frequency interference? Yeah, Bill, I, Bill, I got one for you. What's what's your feeling about having uh, center grounded uh, antenna switches? 
that are, you know, go, uh, get done to out naturally. Uh, those are for people who forget to disconnect their antenna cables with lightning approaching. Uh, Here, here's, you, here's might get, thing. you might get lucky. Okay, here's, here's the reason why I bring that up. Uh, I've seen, especially with the upcoming springtime, it's real nice to go and disconnect your coax, but you have a wonderful spark plug that can cause a fire also. A it, should, it, should be, it should be outside your home. And preferably actually bonded to your grounding system. Well, I've got it grounded all, all of that. I, besides eight foot ground rods, and, and uh, they use grounding bars, similar to what they use in, in electrical uh, circuit breaker boxes, where that's what I'm using, really, with ground wires, something to that, and then uh, number four going to make for the ground rod. Hey, I, I got it. Other than moving to a place where there is no lightning, the only prevention uh, method that works well is disconnecting. And if you disconnect it and lay it here in the shack, which in my case happens to be carpeted, that could be a very bad thing. Because static electricity without a lightning strike anywhere is more than enough to create a spark across that PL259. And I, that, uh, I experienced that in upper Michigan at a radar site where somehow, I don't know how, an 80 and 40 meter dipole went up 80 feet on the utility poles that held up our UHF antennas as an Air Force radar site. I have no idea how any of those wires got there, but there was a coax that came down and uh, connected to my, uh, oh, what was it? It was a Heathkit monoband HW12, I think, uh, 80 meter radio. and if I heard sparking inside the radio, I unplugged it and then got away from the radio because I hadn't disconnected the cable yet. Luckily, the radio never blew up. But I remember that tube devices are much less susceptible to uh, electrostatic discharge than a solid state device. And there's lots of protection uh, in many radios today. But the, only, the most effective protection is disconnecting the antenna cable outside. And don't forget the rest of the cables. I would never use this except for Christmas tree lighting, uh, two wires, but this cable plugged into the outlet is a means by which lightning has a path. And so if it's a cable and it comes into your shack, Find a way to disconnect it. Now, the DSL line will not provide the same potential that the 130 foot long uh, 80 meter dipole up above the house will. And that is really good for, oh, it's winter time, right? Have you seen any snow lately? Yes, go oh, yes. Yes, Bill, I have. Snow blowing past your wire antennas can generate thousands of volts of static electricity. Don't ask me how I know, I, I read about it. Uh, uh, as can, what comes after winter in New Mexico and elsewhere, spring. Do we have any blowing dust in New Mexico? Maybe, thousands of volts of electricity generated on your uh, wire antennas. So. Uh, what you were talking about, Larry, with a, uh, a grounded antenna switch, that's probably going to keep that static electricity from getting into your gear. Not going to help for a nearby strike. And wh uh, what's going to help with a uh, direct strike? No connections to anything. No connections. So always have a spare radio. If you have an IC7300, go out and buy another one. Or better yet, Alcraft K3s are a real bargain now that guys are selling them, getting ready to buy, or already have purchased a K4, anxiously awaiting its arrival. There's one other point which which 
people don't consider, uh, and that's EMP. If you have a, a strike like I did close to my, it, it hit my antenna. It dissolved the 80 meter stinger and then jumped to the ground. Uh, part of the strike went through the seven turn loop, traveled 110, 120 feet into the house and wiped out my antenna tuna and went the other way uh, through the uh, lightning protector into the eight foot ground right. But EMP wiped out uh, uh, a small power supply, uh, a little seven inch black and white TV, and worst of all, my Quirzenot uh, coffee meter grinder. Oh no. Uh, so that it's EMP is a whole nother issue. Electromagnetic pulse, that's something generated by an atomic explosion and lightning. Lightning can generate EMP. Then it's magic, it goes through the air. That's Bill, all I have, David, unless you have, others have questions. Bill, I have, I have a, a question really about one of the comments that you had made, and I just wanted to clarify that point. You said to connect uh, the shack's ground rods to the house ground, is that, did I hear you correctly? That's correct. So run a number six or a number four wire from my shack ground rods, and if in my case, it's pretty short, to the outside connection where it goes into the house ground. That's correct. And the intent of that is to maintain the same level of potential. Okay. Could you cover, and, and maybe it's covered someplace in the book, I only saw one diagram that was in here about uh, grounding your amplifiers and their power supplies, or is that really another topic? No, that's the same topic. And one of the slides I had up showed you that those were all connected together. Okay, same as that was in the book. Yep, and, yeah. and it's in the book as well. Yeah, and, right. and again, the, the, the concept of bonding is to have everything at the same potential. In a mobile uh, situation, the same thing is true. Nothing to do with your antenna. I'm talking about if you have a radio and do like I do, and I admit I'm weird, I drive around in New Mexico for the New Mexico QSO party, making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of contacts on HF, the computer is bonded to the radio in order to eliminate noise. Because what I often do is I'll play messages from my computer into the radio. Uh, uh, voice messages. So I want to have everything at the same potential. I'm not worried about lightning, although I can tell you, I'll know right away if static electricity is building up on my mobile antenna, and I will carefully disconnect the coax with one hand, the other hand's in my pocket, disconnect that. So I'm not taking any chances. I don't need contact so bad that uh, static electricity, even though there's protection inside the K3, I don't want static the chance of static electricity damaging my radio. The computer has uh, lots of plastic. Yeah. What do you put them right? Well, what do you where do you connect the ground wire? Uh, you can often find. Uh, a screw somewhere that's attached to a metal chassis. Also often, the USB, a USB jack, the low side of it, the ground side for the signal is attached to the chassis, often, not always. And you can find out with an ohm meter if that is the case. So you take an old USB cable and you connect the ground wire, the minus on the signal, and you right. can look up USB jacks and see which of those pins is it, and you connect that to your bonding system. I, I use, by the way, I use a desktop. The only time I use a laptop in the shack would be if my desktop fails. Why? Because I have a full-size keyboard. I've got my logging, program up here directly in front of me. And over here, I have your faces in case I need that for a contest. 
or whatever I've got on a second monitor and my computer is bonded to my system. And uh, I have for this particular keyboard, a uh, big, a two inch ferrite core with a USB cable round, wound through it about a dozen times. Uh, Cause I have an amplifier that puts out 1500 Watts. And my antennas are really close. I, I just changed out my Snap-ons uh, cores with the ring cores that you had uh, mentioned previously on another occasion. And it literally solved the problem. Uh, and, and, and just as soon as I was finished, because on when I was on 10 meters, I think, or 15, it would get into the computer. And with those rings, solved. Fantastic. I was using a two-inch ring. Yeah, what we're talking about a toroid is this round core. Yeah, I think you can see that. It's a round core through which I, I wound the uh, uh, USB cable that comes from, and I'm replacing this with a wireless, so that's not going to be an issue. Of course, the problem with the wireless is be sure your batteries charge up for a 48-hour contest. And the snap-ons, if you if you have snap-on uh, ferrite cores that you put around a cable, they go together like this. I, I'm a radio guy. I'm not used to working TV, so they close up. So you've got a hole there. I should put that on my forehead. Can you know that doesn't work? Okay, you can put the cable through there possibly multiple times. So just snapping on on a single what that's called a turn when you run the cable through it once is often ineffective often and so multiple turns through this is good multiple turns through the ring or toroid core is far 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 better by the way uh jim canine and and i have references at, at the end of this, let me make sure I do, that I'm not lying to you, I'm pretty sure I do. I have a bunch of references, including, uh, should be, yeah, Audio Systems Group, uh, that is uh, Kilo 9 Yankee Charlie uh, website that has a lot of good presentations about, uh, a lot of them about radio frequency interference, how to solve them. One of the biggest problems we have today is people put up a dipole, they connect a piece of coax to it, and they think they're done. Well, if you live in outer space, and I know there are people who do, your antenna near the ground, a dipole, is not truly balanced. It's like me, it's unbalanced. And so we have to, and what that causes is common mode current on the radio frequency transmission line, the coax. And that common mode current causes two problems. RF in the shack, as Zed was describing on transmit and picking up noise on the coax that's not supposed to be part of the antenna. So now I don't have one of those handy, but you can put at the feed point, which is where it belongs, a common mode RF current choke. It has to be a current, not a voltage choke. Many balance are voltage devices, not current devices, and don't do this well to keep that common mode current off the coax coming down. Very helpful to help eliminate uh, the noise that's so typical today. Uh, those of us who are experienced can hear that RF in, yeah, there's one, Elmer's holding up what looks like it could be uh, a plumbing device in PVC, but also an, R, an RF current choke. Very, very helpful. That's a whole nother two to three presentations. You know, uh, Bill, there's another type of interference um, for audio rectification. 
that uh, comes into play uh, many times, especially if you're using uh, expensive or old uh, speaker yep. wire. And yeah, you're if you're very neat also, um, I ran into a situation, situation once where someone called the uh, uh, OVO cables from a star and TV and tied them all together in a very Larry, neat Larry, you're, you're broken up. I can't understand you. Okay, I'll uh, say it again. Uh, if you take cables and you loop them all together and tape them together, and they're not shielded, or even if they are cheaply shielded, you're going to get interference that way into some of the devices. It, in, in some respects, it's better if it's like a, a rat's nest of wires because one will cancel out the other. Yeah, don't use cheap wiring. Right. I know your hams, but don't use cheap stuff. Again, think about it. I'm always amazed at people who spend a thousand or two or three or four or five or six thousand on a radio, and then they look for the cheapest microphone they can buy or the cheapest whatever. Don't be so cheap. I tell you, Bill, I certainly do thank you so much for uh, really jumping in at the last minute, putting your uh, things you had planned aside to uh, come and do this presentation for us today. Uh, I know that you don't do it for your benefit, you do it for our benefit. And um, I'm hearing some squeaky noises. Am I coming through okay? You're sounding good. Somebody else is un was unmuted. Okay. Uh, so again, you know, applause. Thank you. I'm sure everyone here learned a lot today. Uh, just, uh, just so you know, I have one of these. <laughs> and no, it it's doesn't not look yours. very. It doesn't look very well worn, David. Um, that's because it's new, Bill. It's new. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so, yes, thank you all very much. Uh, Elmer, what are you trying to show? I'm not getting. Oh, that's his. Show. That's his uh, bonding thing, I think. Yep, that's where he bonds everything together. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. I, I noticed that Zulu 35 Tango's on 20 meters right now, in North Macedonia, but I've already worked him. I just need a confirmation. So he's, it's okay. He's not, it ARRL International DX CW contest this weekend goes yes. on through 5 p.m. Sunday evening. Well, I certainly do thank you again for taking your valuable time to share with us. Because like I said, you don't do this for your benefit. You do it for ours. And we truly, you know, truly appreciate it. The, uh, you're welcome. But keep in mind that it, when any of us teach anybody else, we learn. That's true. Yeah. Very good. And just so everyone knows, this is being recorded. And we'll go to the uh, website along with the presentation slides that Bill forwarded to me. So you'll have two sources of reference there um, in, in a few hours, because <laughs> it takes a while to download. David, actually, the, uh, the slide presentation is already up. Oh, beautiful. OK, yeah. perfect. Was, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't want the video of this. <laughs> I've, already <laughs> told, I've already told too many people the video will be there. <laughs> Um, the uh, uh, following the following the meeting when we shut this down, um, we are going to attempt a um, a, a whammo on the club's UHF machine, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, if uh, everybody can slide on over there, I mean uh, a lot of whammos can be worked because there's a lot of new faces here so far as the whammos go. Um, and uh, the vice president of the club, Ken, uh, uh, AG5UY, would like to address the membership for just a few moments. And, um, uh, you know, the non-members aren't required to leave, but, uh, you know, we're just going to be talking kind of member things and, and business for the club. So 
Uh, Kenneth, go ahead. I like your picture, Kenneth. Thank you. I uh, wanted to address everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, we're all very fortunate. We have roofs over our head. We have full bellies and, and we're warm. There's a lot of people suffering. I think that uh, as part of our club, which is a uh, federally um, chartered nonprofit corporation, not just some social club of loosely members hanging around, that um, we could do something uh, since we, we haven't been able to get out and really spread ham radio or to go to any presentations, I would like to just get the feedback to see if the members would agree to donating some money. Um, I would, uh, I had four uh, different charities. I would ask that we donate $250 to each charity. The first would be the Rio Grande Down Syndrome Network. The second, Joy Junction. The third, the Roadrunner Food Bank and the fourth, the New Mexico Law Enforcement Officers Fund to take care of the families of fallen officers. And I was wondering if we could just get uh, a consensus of club members to see if we agree to be charitable and help out our fellow Albuquerque people. Thanks. And the way, we could, the way we could indicate this is just like when we were talking with Bill Firth, we'll just assume everybody's in favor of it unless you tell us, no, I don't want to do this. And again, if your camera's working, do it this way. We'll get to you in a second. Uh, when the... I'd like to make a comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I think there's a lot of members that aren't in today. It should be done through an email. Specify those four. I don't remember which four they were. They all sound great, but I think it should be uh, broadcast to all the members through an email. That's that's fine. We'll do that because I and we did give to Roadrunner already recently, right? Well, I, I I think what what my push is is that we really haven't been able to get out do explore. We haven't been able to go out and really spread ham radio. And part of our charter as a nonprofit corporation is that we give back to the community in exchange for getting a tax-free status. And so I'd just like to see the club. I mean, we all know that there's people hurting out there. We're all fairly blessed that we have homes to live in. And uh, I, I'm just 100% behind this to be able to, to help out the other people in Albuquerque. But I think it's a good idea to send it on an email and uh, just give everybody an idea of what we're doing. And uh, I can't see anybody objecting to it, but you never know. And these... Uh... These four charities, they're all 501c3s as well, right? Correct. Correct. Okay, very good. Uh, so look for that email. And uh, the um, uh, again, thanks to Bill Mater for coming and uh, doing this for us today. Uh, uh, Elmer will has has moved to May. Uh, his presentation on Elmer's Adventures in All Star will be in May, and he will follow that at some point in time with some uh, presentations on um, DMR radio. And uh, so look forward to that. Uh, next month, we have a presenter who's going to be talking about, and this is where my brain has failed me. Uh, Jerry Jurens has contacted this person to do the presentation. I have no idea where the paper is. I wrote it all down on. Uh, Jerry, are you still on? Yes, I am. I was just muted. Do, do, uh, who, who is the person you have doing the presentation for March and what is it on? So there's this uh, woman who is a, uh, uh, an historian who has made it her life's work to study the early foundations of radio going all the way back to, you know, Marconi and, you know, people before that and whatnot. And uh, she gave a tremendous talk back in December to the David Sarnoff Radio Club, uh, which I'm still a member back in New Jersey. And it was so good. I said, oh, my goodness. So I, I contacted her and I said, would you be willing to give that talk or, you know, some version of it to my radio club here in Albuquerque? And she said, I'd be delighted. So... I'll have to give you the name and all the you know information and stuff again. It's in an e it's in a series of emails over. 
Excellent. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. You're um, and uh, following her uh, in um, April, again, you know, I had a piece of paper. I was writing all this stuff down and I cleaned my desk. Need I say more? <laughs> uh, uh, some feller here local uh, was going to do a quick little presentation on uh, something uh, <laughs> that uh, I think it was D-Star, but I'm not real pro. I, I don't think it's D-Star. It wouldn't be because we just had a nice D-Star. Anyway, something uh, hopefully will show up in um, uh, April. Anyway, uh, thank you all for showing up. Appreciate it. Thanks to the members. Thanks to the visitors. I think we had about 50 people here today. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to see a bunch of you move on over to the uh, 442750 repeater and uh, run, run a few whammos. I know there's a bunch of folks that uh, uh, meet on a regular basis and they'd love to work some, some uh, new stuff, new meat. <laughs> Bill, David, you understand? David, before you go, can you explain to me what paper is? Paper? paper. paper Notes on paper? Bill, paper is something you use with your crayons. Show us your crayons. With these? It, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Just checking. They make books. Oh, and have... what? And it's a sharp thing. Be careful of that sharp thing, Bill. Oh. They make books that have outlined pictures in it that you can use the crayons and just stay within the lines. <laughs> hey, if you, actually get, if you actually get an Echolink or All-Star note on those repeaters, we might be able to check in from afar there too as well, you know, to work the whammo in that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, it's going to be on the, the club's 442 machine. Um, is there any way you can get there from uh, All-Star? Not unless you guys have an all-star node already there. I mean, I, I can do I can do a lot of miracle things, but I know well, the, the all-star node is on Jerry's, you know, 220 machine. No, that's IRP. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't I don't know habla that. No habla. <laughs> anyway, thanks all for uh, for showing up and sharing part of your most valuable asset, and that is your time. And I sincerely appreciate it. We'll look for you over on the the whammo. Talk to you later. Hey, if you can catch me on whammo, I'm number 32. Bye. <laughs>